If you've played enough Star Wars games or read enough Star Wars books, there's probably two things you've noticed. The first is that fleets and fleet battles are really cool, and the second is that fleet sizes in Star Wars just make no sense. They're wildly inconsistent. In some books, a couple Star Destroyers make up the entire Galactic Imperial fleet. In others, there are individual battles with hundreds upon hundreds of starships, including planetary defense forces, with dozens of superships. Today we're going to talk about the variance in fleet sizes between different sources, and give a bit of background on what's going on behind the scenes there. This is known as the minimalist versus maximalist debate within Star Wars for fleet sizes. As with a lot of other similar videos to this, where I pick apart certain aspects of the Star Wars universe and break down where they came from, I want to emphasize that this is not necessarily a criticism or an inherently bad thing that it varies this much between different sources. Each source we're going to be talking about was trying to tell a specific story, and use fleet sizes that made sense for the story they were trying to tell, or for the budget of whatever they were doing for more visual mediums, like TV shows and movies where they couldn't just write in a bigger fleet. This doesn't mean that I don't find some of the examples to be kind of ridiculously small or large, but it's generally something I've been able to look beyond. Hopefully it doesn't ruin your enjoyment of different sources or different examples of Star Wars media when you find this kind of thing inconsistent, but I think it's still fun to look into why it's like that. There have been some pretty hard numbers established in certain source books or novels for specific things, but even these can sometimes have a pretty broad range. There are a few consistent points about relative fleet sizes though. For one thing, the Clone Wars was essentially the height of military buildup in the galaxy, counting all the local defense forces, battle droids, corporate fleets, and so on. Spectre of the Past by Timothy Zahn also established the Empire as having about 25,000 Star Destroyers at its height, which tends to stay relatively consistent as a vague number to be referenced. And there would have been millions of other support ships beyond that as well. Then, by the time of the Yuuzhan Vong invasion, the galaxy's military forces had actually been whittled down considerably, including some mothballing by the New Republic, so we tend to have much smaller, but also more compact and effective navies by 25 years after the Battle of Yavin. You can quibble with some of this stuff with different sources, but they are broadly consistent as a framework, that it goes from Clone Wars, down to Galactic Civil War, and then down even further by the Yuuzhan Vong War. And the fact that it varies so much in its specifics is kind of the point of this video anyways. Earlier novels in particular, especially from the early 90s, tend to have a pretty limited view of what the Star Wars galaxy could sustain in general. A lot of sources took the implied point of the Battle of Endor being a huge portion of the Empire's military, and almost the entirety of the Rebel fleet if not the whole thing. But later sources have spread that out a bit between different Rebel cells and fleets being active elsewhere, and has specified that Death Squadron, Vader's personal battle group, was the Imperial unit present. Trusa Bakura, an early book set directly after Endor, essentially implies that the Battle of Endor wiped out all Imperial forces in that entire quadrant of the galaxy, and left only a Carrick class cruiser as the essentially only force in the area able to defend Bakura against a galaxy threatening invasion of the Saurian Siru V Imperium, which itself only consisted of a couple ships, and then was beaten by a Carrick and a Quasar, that Quasar being all the rebels could even really spare themselves. Later sources, again, flesh out the Sea Ruby as more of a threat, with way more ships than were behind the initial invasion, but that one small task force that was beaten by the Carrick and the Quasar was apparently enough to stop any broader invasion. There's actually a war that lasts years between the New Republic and the Sea Ruby, referenced a couple times in other Bantam era books, Bantam being the publisher for most of the Star Wars books in the 90s, essentially. Other Bantam books, for example the Thrawn trilogy and the X-Wing books, often include major battles for important targets, even Coruscant, featuring only a couple capital ships and rarely more than one Imperial class Star Destroyer, with Victory Star Destroyers being far more common, and even smaller ships tending to be the majority of a force in, a different, in various places. Even when the occasional Super Star Destroyer is involved, like Lusankia or Iron Fist, both of which play massive roles in the X-Wing books, you don't get more than two or three capital ships supporting it or even fighting it, really. Thrawn's main fleet in the Thrawn trilogy comes down to six Star Destroyers making up his main force, and while some other ships are implied to be in the background, doing other things on other planets, even the Battle of Bilbringi is a relatively limited engagement. It's not until other source books start fleshing out more of what's going on in the galaxy that you get a better sense for what's going on, but you still don't get battles that are especially large or represent much of what's going on, no matter how pivotal the battle ends up being. Throughout the same books, interdictors are implied to be incredibly rare, with only a handful existing in the galaxy at once, though Thrawn makes heavy use of them. Later sources put six at a single battle in the Battle of Arinda under Gilad Pelion, one of the 
the larger battles of the post indoor period and featuring three superstar destroyers. But often during some of the earlier books, a lot of the Imperial factions tend to have to loan out the interdictors between each other. You can see a lot of similar minimalism in a lot of movies and TV shows. The 2008 Clone War series tends to only have a handful of ships at any given engagement, compared to the earlier 2003 series, where there tended to be dozens more in the couple battles that we saw, albeit generally each battle only had one type of ship per side. The movies do have some pretty big battles in them. The Battle of Coruscant is one of the biggest battles we ever see, and it's uh, like a thousand times bigger than the Battle of Coruscant that happens during the Galactic Civil War to liberate it from the Empire. Then we have the Battle of Exegol and Rise of Skywalker, which has tons of ships in it. And then even in Rogue One with the Battle of Scarif, we get several ships, although not many on the Imperial side, really. And then we have the Battle of Endor, which has a couple dozen ships on each side. But this far outstrips anything we ever see in any of the Phantom books, even for battles of places like Coruscant, which is kind of the prime example for this. And it does vary from book to book, like Courtship of Princess Leia with the final assault on Zinj's forces. You get dozens of capital ships once again, compared again to the invasion of Coruscant, which is only a couple ships. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we have the Maximalist sources. A lot of comics tend to fall more into this category, and even some sourcebook reference images. If you look at most renderings by Fractal Sponge, for example, there's often multiple super ships and dozens if not hundreds of smaller ships around, like in this render of Naval Station Valaduja. The biggest examples really are the comics, though. The Tales of the Jedi comics have quite a few large ships in almost every panel, but the gold standard of maximalism tends to be the Dark Empire series. Now, a lot of the battles are actually fairly small and limited when you get to read through these comics, but then you get to the Biss defense fleet. Even by the standards of Dark Empire and other comics, this fleet was supposed to essentially be the largest force the galaxy had seen. But the sheer amount of ship types around the planet is staggering, let alone the individual ships themselves. A lot of these background images were later fleshed out into other designs, like the Bellator, and there's just an absurd number of Super Star Destroyers alone in this fleet. Additional source books that detailed some of the campaigns coming out of this fleet included some of the numbers and types in more detail, and there were, for example, at least three Vengeance class Super Star Destroyers alone used in Operation Shadowhand, let alone every other type of Super Star Destroyer that was used in that. Well, I do I do think some of these maximalist examples get a little out of hand, like the Biss Defense Fleet. I do tend to keep my own headcanon more towards the maximalist side when thinking about just how much there is out there in the galaxy. Just think, these are the full navies of galaxy-spanning governments in some cases, with entire planets often being used purely for resource extraction. Knowing what we have seen even just here on Earth compared to what some of these planets have as their full defensive force, even some of the more important ones just doesn't check out. There are some places with reasonably high populations in which are relatively industrialized in the X-Wing books, for example, but where the entire defense force is a couple squadrons of TIE fighters. Canada alone in the real world has 400 fighter jets. We don't cover the entire planet, and that's not even considering the tonnage of other ships we have. So the idea that a lot of the planets in the galaxy have one or two squadrons as the whole thing defending them, and then trying to scale that into the galaxy, it doesn't really make that much sense. I do think that these numbers exist for a simple and valid reason, though. As I mentioned at the start, it's important for every source to take the numbers that make sense for what they're trying to do. Star Wars is very often about trying to emphasize the impact of individual characters, their skills, and their choices. It's easy enough to have a single fighter pilot, for example, shift the course of a battle or even a war if there's smaller numbers of ships they have to deal with. People can get behind Corrin Horn taking out four or five ace pilots in a battle, but if you tried to have Rogue Squadron kill hundreds of fighters, that's harder to justify. The later New Jedi Order books, and even into Legacy Era, tended to have somewhat larger battles than the earlier Bantam stuff, but also tended to have less direct personal impact from specific characters on the battles, instead focusing on how the characters chose to engage with the war they were in as a whole, like Jason Solo's story. When there were single battle-defining events, they tended to be single combat between opposing characters, like the duel on Ithor between Corrin Horde and Shire Oshai, or events like the Battle of Borlaeus, where the Lusankia was used as a giant spear to destroy a world ship. So again, rather than focusing on how many individual enemy combatants a character could kill to turn the tide of a battle like they do a lot in X-Wing, but less often later, they try to find ways to have those characters have an impact and frame it differently, and often it doesn't even really matter what individual characters do in the battles, it's more how they fit into the broader war. There are a lot of books or comics or especially TV shows like the 2003 Clone Wars cartoon that do have larger battles but also try to focus more on individuals having a larger impact in the battle, and those tend to be the things where you get more powerful individual characters and certain other things generic 
Strike enemies being used as fodder. So the really powerful Jedi that you get in the Clone Wars 2003 series is made possible partly because of just the scale of the battles that they have going on there. In that way, a lot of the power level for characters is a function not of just their training or whatever else that's internal to the character, but more a function of the scale of the battles the author wants to have versus the amount of impact that an author or a game designer or whoever wants to have that character have on the overall state of the galaxy. So the Force Unleashed, I think, is another good example where the character is made massively powerful, but that's because they want you as the player to have that giant impact on what's going on. They want you to feel like this massively powerful uh, warrior slicing through everything, pulling down the Star Destroyer, all that. Whereas if you look at Jedi Fallen Order, it tends to be a lot more limited, uh, smaller group combat, and often one-on-one -on -one combat. So even though it's hard to say just based on that, that like Cal is that much less powerful than Starkiller, even if, if you were to take it at face value, that's what the games are presenting. It's just that's the scale that the games are working on. So again, I'm not necessarily pointing this out as a problem per se. I do think it's an inconsistency, but it's one that comes up by the necessity to tell stories that the authors or creators want to tell. And that's what the universe as a whole really is not to be. For nerds like me who want to nail down some better specifics for what the galaxy was quote-unquote really like, source books often do a decent enough job of gelling these things together. But at a certain point, you just have to accept that the universe wasn't necessarily designed to be that thing and kind of live with the results. So this was a pretty broad overview, but I think there's some fun and interesting topics within this kind of framework that could make for good videos on their own. One that really jumps out is the number of clone troopers that actually existed in the Clone Wars, which is its own can of worms. Either way, I hope you've enjoyed this broader look at fleet sizes, and if you have any extra thoughts or there's a topic you'd like to see me cover in another video, please leave those in the comments. If you've enjoyed, consider leaving a like or subscribing for more. Either way, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next time.